So when we think about the biggest threats facing humanity in the period ahead, we have existential threats, which means threats to the continued existence of our species. And we have catastrophic threats that are not quite existential, meaning maybe some humans make it in some pocket somewhere, but we've really lost what we think of as the progress of civilization and maybe the quality of the biosphere. There are so many different catastrophic and existential threats that trying to address them individually is pretty close to impossible. So when we think about existential threats, we think about uh, issues posed by exponential tech that can have runaway consequences that we might not be able to stop once initiated and we might not be able to um, understand ahead of time because we don't forecast totally new things that have exponential time curves very well. So we think about issues associated with AI, with biotech and genotech, with nanotech, and those categories of exponential technology where the technology gives us better capacity to make more of that technology. Um, and then we think about all of the catastrophic risks associated with environmental destruction, so climate change, ocean acidification, biodiversity loss, uh, peak uh, keystone species loss, et cetera, et cetera, dead zones and oceans. And the key thing, the key insight is that there are underlying generator functions, just a couple generator functions that are what drive all of those. And if we identify the generator functions and find categorical solutions to those, we can actually prevent all of those issues. And if we don't, we can't actually prevent them at a symptomatic level. So let's go ahead and get into the generator functions. When we think about environmental issues. And first thing is when we think about environmental issues, we have to understand that it's not just the environment out there, that we have these possibilities of cascades from environmental issues to social issues to escalating social issues. So for instance, when we look at climate change leading to human migration and massive refugee crises, and then nations not wanting to take the refugees, and then the possibility of resource wars over shortages of resource and then escalation of wars, we can go from an environmental issue to an existential issue pretty quickly because of the interconnectivity of the problems and the cascade phenomena. And the same is true with any depletion of a resource that humans depend on that leads to resource shortages, um, et cetera. So let's say we just focus on carbon and we're trying to decrease carbon emissions, but we're not in the process focused on methane, we're not focused on nitrous oxide, we're not focused on particulate emissions, we're not focused on dead zones in ocean, nitrogen effluent runoff, all those other issues. At most, we take the catastrophic curves associated with anthropogenic CO2 and we move the time scale a tiny bit before the other issues are basically overdetermined, causing the same type of collapse scenario. So if we don't actually address why do we have these types of unsustainability toxicity dynamics, if we don't address that at the level of what is generating all of them, we don't end up extending humanity's time scale very significantly at all. So what all of those environmental ones have in common as a generator function is we can think of them as toxicity dynamics, where toxicity is defined as accumulation, so some type of pollution in an area where it wasn't, and depletion, depletion of some types of resources. Depletion and accumulation are the result of open loops, things that in nature would have been in a closed feedback loop, where that feedback loop has been broken open, so it's depleting in one area and leading to accumulation in another area. All toxicity from a network theoretic perspective is a result of open loop materials economies, choice making processes, etc. And so without creating comprehensive loop closure, you end up having a larger population with larger resource per capita in a linear materials economy on a finite planet, creating increased depletion and accumulation dynamics, meaning increased toxicity until you get to collapse points, threshold and collapse points. And that's across almost every type of resource. And so the, now the, the interesting thing here is that this is not a new problem. This is a problem that has been around as long as the thing that we call recorded history. So as soon as we started being able to extract resources from the environment faster than they could replenish themselves, and put things into the environment that faster than they were being processed by the environment. That was the beginning of these types of unsustainable toxicity dynamics. And one of the really important things to understand about all early civilizations is that none of them still exist. When we look at the Maya or the Aztec or the Inca or the Egyptians or the Sumerians or the any of the early civilizations or the Roman Empire, right, more recent ones, they all had a growth period and they all collapsed. And so as you were near the end of one of those empires, the idea of collapse seemed impossible because it had been around for hundreds or thousands of years. Collapse wasn't in anyone's memory. They were pretty sure they had got it figured out just like we are pretty sure now. And they all collapsed for similar types of dynamics. And one of them are these types of toxicity dynamics. And so when we study the history of the thing we call civilization, we see that humans have created deserts with unrenewable agriculture for the whole time and that ended up then leading to the people not being able to feed themselves and having to migrate or civilization collapse. We have seen uh, that we had massive wealth inequality in all of those systems that then ended up leading to so many people disenfranchised that they had internal civil war type dynamics. And we see that they dealt with differences with other people by killing each other. So the thing that we call civilization has not really ever been civil, right? It has been the history of empire, but it's something that we would call civilization we are still aspiring towards. And that's really the hope of what we're discussing here. 
A key difference in all those early civilizations that collapsed in this one is that they weren't truly global. Right? Even the Roman Empire, as large as it was, when it collapsed, wasn't the collapse of everything. And with our level of technology and globalization, when we look at the, the TV or laptop or cell phone that we're watching this show on, it was produced across six continents. And it actually couldn't even be produced right now on any one continent in terms of where the minerals were mined, where they were processed, where the software was developed, where the hardware was developed, how it came together. Which means that we have a world that is that interconnected where failures anywhere can lead to cascades of failures across the whole system and where the environmental destruction is not just of a local environment and people can still do well somewhere else and then nature can regenerate itself over a long time there, but actually catastrophic failure of the biosphere and its capability to make a, a, a positively habitable planet for Homo sapiens writ large. And so it's not that the types of challenges we face right now are different in kind, different in origin than they've ever been. They're different in scale and in speed, but that's a big deal. And all early civilizations faced existential risk, and they actually all did go extinct, right? And pretty much all. Some of them went through mutations. They went extinct in a particular form. But that the extinction of a particular civilization wasn't all of civilization. This is one of the things that we face that's fundamentally different now. In almost all scenarios of a World War III, and we realize that humanity's not done a good job at dealing with problems without war ever, right? In our history, we, our, our history books, we, the main things that we remember studying are the histories of war and conquest because the underlying rivalrous game theoretic dynamics that drive those types of processes, right? You use up resources unrenewably because of open loop dynamics. You get into resource shortages. You compete for those scarce resources. And at a certain point, the economic competition becomes a militaristic competition. Um, but as we go from stone weapons to Bronze Age weapons, to guns, to missiles, to intercontinental ballistic missiles, to AI weaponized drone systems, what we're doing is the same idea that we fundamentally are at odds with them, we disagree with them, and the answer is to kill them. We've just been able to kill them from much further distance at greater scale easier, but so have they. One of the key things to understand is that the idea of asymmetric advantage, there is no such thing as sustained asymmetric advantage of a particular type. Because if we develop some new type of technology, some new spy tech, some new military tech, some new economic tech, the moment we deploy it, if it's successful, everybody sees it, makes iterations and modifications on it, and then also deploys it. So the idea, hey, we're the good guys, they're the bad guys, so we're going to use some whatever great tech we have, it's our new crypto tech or our new uh, deep learning to be able to get our progressive uh, message out through media, you know, manipulation of media systems, whatever it is, whatever piece of technology we develop and then implement will end up being utilized by all parties for all purposes. And so really, any development of increased technological power to win at a win-lose game increases the technological power across the whole playing field, across all agents for all purposes. And that's what we've been seeing, is we've been seeing, we can think of history as we can think of the history of what we call civilization as the history of evolving win-lose game dynamics, right? Evolving rivalrous game theoretic dynamics. And so we go from tribes where if the resources were plentiful relative to the population, the tribes left each other alone because it was just easier to do that and it's better to do that. And then as soon as they started competing for the same hunting or the same scat, you know, uh, foraging too much, then they would migrate because it was easier to migrate than to war. But when they had migrated all the places they could migrate and the only answer was to have to deal with each other, then they would go into economic competition for the scarce resource with each other, which means now rather than just take whatever pigs I need, I'm going to try and take the pigs faster because if I leave them, the other guys will get them. There's a scarce number of them. And now we're in a tragedy of the commons race to the cliff type scenario. And then at a certain point, the indirect competition for resource extraction becomes so threatening to our survival that it leads to a direct militaristic competition, force projection competition. So then some tribe realizes they can kill the other tribe, get their kind of prime riverfront property, decrease the competition for resources, gather the stuff they made, and it's actually better for them. As Soon as they realize this and they start to employ the strategy more widely, every other tribe has to also militarize itself or lose by default. So the win-lose game, first insight is that throughout history, win-lose games actually worked. And so when, you, when we study the art of war, the art of strategy. What we study is how to be successful at winning at fundamentally win-lose games, rivalrous games. And, and the key insight is that they worked. And the second insight is that they were obligate, meaning if anyone else played them and you didn't play, you lost by default. So history has been a process of who was better at winning at win-lose games, which also means who is better at being able to cause losses, right? And those losses were the direct losses of the other and the indirect losses to the environment and the commons. With scaling technological capacity, those losses just get larger, right? The, the fallout, the externality of that process gets larger. So then, of course, if you're a tribe and you're being prepared for militaristic conflict with another tribe and they're bigger than you, you think maybe if I merge with this other tribe, this other smaller tribe, we can both survive together. And now we start getting groups of tribes and we start getting the evolution of 
uh, fiefdoms and kingdoms and nation states and global economic trading blocs that are basically larger in-groups competing against growing out-groups for resource extraction, information asymmetries, militaristic strategic competitive advantage. That We can think of the whole history of civilization in this way, right? But when we, if, if we keep doing that dynamic and we start having exponential technological curves, and we're really at the verticalizing part of exponential curves now for the first time ever, like the Industrial Revolution started an in inflection, but it was really with um, computation and the ability of computers to make better computers and the ability of computers to start making better biotech and biotech making better biotech. We really start to get in the verticalizing part of these curves. Then exponential extraction, again, from a finite planet, leads to collapse of the biosphere. And that's what we're doing right now, right? A growing population, increased resource consumption per capita, exponential extraction, and then turning it into trash. So exponential pollution, finite planet, that's a self-terminating scenario. Exponential military capacity that causes direct harm to other when realizing that all sides end up having the same dynamic. We don't actually get to make it through World War III. The technology is too powerful and too multipolar to be able to make it through, but we also don't know how to, in any long game to navigate win-lose games that don't involve war. And so we're really tasked with doing something that has never been done before, which is having a civilization that doesn't collapse, being able to deal with conflicts not through war, and being able to have this much technological capacity that we don't use destructively. So frame it up another way. We have always used the technological power that we've created for some purposes that we can call positive and other purposes that for some agents would be called negative, right? Whether that's environmental destruction, killing other people, suppressing people, whatever. If we have, and that's the result of the rivalrous game dynamic, that the win at one side is the loss at another side, right? We're competing for a win in some kind of zero-sum finite game dynamic. Rivalrous games multiplied by exponential technology self-terminate in every scenario. Because exponential technology means exponential destructive capacity, and even though it also means constructive capacity, the destructive capacity ends the whole game, so the constructive capacity doesn't matter. It's important to realize that it might take me a year to build this building, but I can take it down in minutes with a record ball. Right? It might take me 20 years to grow an adult human, but we can kill them in a second. Destruction is just easier. Entropy is easier. There's a lot more ways to put 50 trillion cells together that don't make a human and that just make kind of a biological mess than the very few ways you can put them together to actually get a human. And so when we start thinking about what are the consequences of new exponential technology, there are statistically more of them that are destructive than constructive, but at a big enough scale that we actually cannot live through the consequences of their destructive capacity. So. We cannot put the exponential technology curve back in the bag. We can't even slow it down. The reason we can't slow it down is because we're currently caught in what we would call a multipolar trap. And multipolar traps, like a multipolar prisoner's dilemma. So the tragedy of the commons or the arms race are examples of multipolar traps. So we don't want weaponized AI drones. Like nobody actually wants a world with weaponized AI drones, with facial recognition. Everybody knows that that's a really bad idea. And that if we do it, there's a pretty good chance we'll all die from those weapons. But we also don't make a treaty to not make weaponized AI drones and nobody make them because we know that if we made that treaty, we would assume that the other side was defecting against it secretly and then they would get the capacity and they would rule the world. So we defect against it secretly while disinforming the other side that we aren't and spying on them. And so that scenario of that kind of multipolar trap, it's the same thing of like, okay, I don't wanna cut down all the trees. But if I leave the trees, there isn't actually going to be a forest because the other guy's going to cut down all the trees. And the other guy's actually my economic competitor, and my life gets worse if he gets ahead. And I have, I have all the economic incentive to cut the trees down. I have no economic incentive to leave them, and I don't even get a forest if I leave them because he's going to do it. But he's thinking the same thing about me, so I race to cut down the trees as fast as I can, and he does. So we both increase our tree cutting down technology and capacity. This is a classic race to the cliff, right? And you can see this in terms of fishing. You can see this in terms of all material acquisition process. We can see it in all military process. So the multipolar trap, right, which is the result of a multiplayer rival risk game theoretic dynamic, is an underlying generator function of the things that have always sucked. But with exponential technology, we get exponential suck, which ends up equaling catastrophic risk. And so we actually need a categorical solution to multipolar traps, which requires a movement from rival risk to anti-rival risk game theory. Rival risk game theory means that there is some in-group called a company or a country, or a race, or whatever the identity of an in-group is that is competing against some out-groups or willing to externalize harm to some out-groups for some finite win. But again, whatever technological capacity we have to win will end up being found out by and innovated on all sides, and so that just escalates the, the consequence. An anti-rivalrous game means that we create a game where 
our win not only doesn't require their loss or a harm to the commons, but our win necessarily benefits them and vice versa. We've actually coupled our well-beings. And this is not communism. Communism failed at this. It's not socialism. It's also not capitalism. It's not democracy. It's actually not any of the systems for collective sense-making and choice-making we have ever had. Winston Churchill made this famous quote that democracy is the single worst form of governance ever created, save for every other form of governance ever created. And you know, the joke was, the idea of getting a lot of humans to work together and participate together in some effective way is a really hard thing and we're just not good at it yet. And all of the systems that we've created have really serious problems. So as much as we like democracy compared to totalitarianism and other systems, um, it, I just I want to frame democracy in a particular way here. Before democracy, but for the whole history of the thing that we call civilization, uh, I mean, for the whole history of Homo sapiens, most of it, we lived in very small tribes. In a very small tribe, everybody could know everyone. Everyone could care about everyone closely. There were no anonymous people. There was no spaces that you affected called far away. And you could actually all sit in a circle and talk. Everybody could hear everyone's perspective. And if anyone was really unhappy with the choice that the village made, it would be so problematic because you're with them all the time that it really wouldn't work. So they had a very slow but effective process, because they also didn't have changes that needed to happen that quickly most of the time, of a kind of more egalitarian consensus-based system. But it caps out at a very small number of people, because you can't have a very huge number of people all have a conversation until they come to agreement. So to be able to start to scale to numbers larger than about 150, right, larger than Dunbar number, we had to have a process where not everybody had to agree, which means that some people were going to be really unhappy with what happened, which means it's going to be marginalizing to some people. So democracy said, let's at least have a system where most more people are happy with a thing that goes through than unhappy with it. And since we can't all have a conversation around it, we'll end up picking representatives who do most of the conversation for us. And the main thing we do is pick a representative. And we'll pick propositions. And the proposition won't actually represent what we care about, but it'll represent a little part of it to try and make it easier. So you think about the process of a proposition. Proposition is someone puts forward some idea, typically because they have some partial sensing of something that matters to them, right? some problem they want to solve. And typically some vested interest of the part of the overall landscape of connected issues that they care about. And you notice that. None of the propositions are very well formed. If they were, everyone would like it, right? The proposition, if it goes through, whatever it is, proposition A, if it goes through, benefits some things and harms other things. And if it doesn't go through, it benefits some other things and harms some other things, which is why some people want it and some people don't want it. Because if the thing that gets benefited is something that you really need, then you, identify, you, you want it to go through, and then you identify with the whole in-group that wants it to go through. And if what would be harmed by it going through this, this other group of people cares about some other thing more, and you see them as actively wanting what would harm what you most care about. Right? So this leads to polarization and eventually radicalization, which we have seen in every democratic system, which we see right now in the world, until the radicalization gets so far that it typically takes civil failure or civil war or something like that to deal with it because we're trying to make a choice before even having a sense of what a good choice would be. Right? There isn't even a sense-making process before a choice-making process to say, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? And maybe there's not one problem. Maybe there's a set of problems we're trying to solve. Can we articulate the whole complex well enough that we can get the design criteria to try and come up with a synergistic satisfier? But that process isn't even engaged in, right? OK, so democracy served an evolutionary role, but we can actually do radically better than that now. So from, if we think about it from a kind of a game theory perspective, there's a few transitions we can think about. We can think about zero-sum games to positive sum and increasingly positive sum games. If it's zero sum, not everybody can get ahead. Somebody getting ahead means somebody else not getting ahead. And so, or it means you have to subsidize the pool so that everybody can get ahead from somewhere, which usually means from the finite savings account of the planet or, you know. But we have to move from zero sum to positive sum, and not just positive sum, but increasingly positive sum. We have to move from win-lose games to not just win-win, but omni-win-win, meaning across the whole supply chain to the commons, that there, isn't a, that there isn't externalized cost. This comes back to this concept of closed loop, that whatever whatever effects arise from a choice are understood ahead of time and internalized into the choice-making process. So we're, look, we're seeking to move progressively better, more competently, in the direction of omnipositive, omniconsiderate choice-making. We can also think about the shift from what we call finite games in Carse's language to infinite games. And these all mirror each other, and they're all very important. Finite game, the goal of a finite game is to win, and when you win, the game's over. So actually, the goal of a finite game, which is pretty much all the things we call games, right? A board game, or chess, or ball, you win, and the game is over, are the same thing. And in, in, until the game is over, you don't know who won, right? So the whole goal of the game is to actually end the game. We don't want that to be our metaphor for how we do life, because that's not a very good metaphor for how we do life. So in an infinite game, if the goal isn't to end the game, you can't define win in that way. So a win in an infinite game is to increase the quality of the play, to continuously increase the quality of play forever. I can't pollute the environment that I'm going to be in tomorrow and increase the quality of play. 
I can't harm others and have them tomorrow be wanting to attack me more and increase the quality of the play. So all the externalized costs that are okay in a finite game, because I'm just rushing to a specific goal and everywhere else externalized harm is okay, in an infinite game don't make any sense. Because in an infinite game, there is no rushing to a specific goal that really matters. There's a continuous increase of the quality of play that matters. When we think about the movement from rivalrous to anti-rivalrous, that's actually essential to play an infinite game. And if we think about the 50 to 100 trillion cells that make up a human body, we see that what's best, that each of those cells are their own individual entity that has its own genetic code that self-regulates that even when the person is in a coma, even after the person is dead, they're still behaving, performing metabolic functions, right? So you've got 50 trillion individuals that are all operating in a way that is good for them as individuals and good for the individuals around them and good for the whole simultaneously. And not just at the level of the cells, but at the level of the components of the cells, right? The mitochondria and the organelles inside of them, at the level of the tissues, the organs, the organ systems, the person, the person to the tribe. You can see this, that the types of systems that nature builds are complex rather than complicated. Complex means self-organizing, so not designed from the outside with a blueprint, but self-organizing, right? Cells self-assemble, fetuses self-assemble, forests. Complex systems that are self-organizing all have a certain type of anti-rivalrous primary, even if there are some competitive elements within it, and there's a lot for us to learn here. Um, so complicated systems. I'm switching topics, I'll come back. Complicated systems is pretty much all the tech humans have ever built. So a complicated system, we draw up a blueprint and for a airplane or for a cell phone or for a water piping system or whatever it is, for a spear, right? And then we build that thing, it doesn't self-organize, it's built from the outside. And the total phase space of all the things that thing can do are a result of what is in the blueprint. Nature doesn't have doesn't build things with blueprints. The complex systems that nature builds have generator functions. So our genome is not actually a fixed blueprint. It's a generator function for how to code different kinds of proteins in novel environments. And it can actually code new proteins that have never happened before in a novel environment with novel kinds of exposures. So it leads to self-organization. And one of the key characteristics is closed loops, closed atomic loops and closed information loops. So you can see in a biosphere, there is no such thing as trash, right? I mean, in, in a natural ecosystem, there's no such thing as trash. Anything that dies ends up being food for some other part of the process, and there's no such thing as an unrenewable resource depletion. So you have closed atomic cycles throughout the entire system. So nature is closed loop, upcycling, meaning you get new higher evolutionary forms occurring over time, so it's not downcycling, and anti-fragile, regenerative anti-fragile. So if, if I get cut, I heal on my own, right? If I damage my laptop, it'll never heal on its own. It has to be fixed from the outside. If a forest burns, it'll start to regenerate. If the house burns, it doesn't regenerate. So the things that humans build are fragile, fundamentally fragile. And here's a key insight. This is another generator function for catastrophic risk. The thing we call civilization is mostly building complicated, fragile systems. Our infrastructure is fragile, right? Our energy grid, our water systems, all of those systems, the computational systems that banking runs on are fragile systems. And they are subsuming, right? the complex anti-fragile substrate of the planet. So complicated system subsuming the complex substrate so the planet is actually getting less anti-fragile, meaning it's getting more fragile, meaning it doesn't have the capacity to regulate climate as well, to be able to keep biodiversity alive as well. So we're decreasing the anti-fragility of the planet to create an increasingly fragile civilization system that we're trying to run exponentially more energy through. That system collapses in every modeling that you can do of it. So back to anti-rivalrous. When you think about the cells in the body operating in a way that's good for them and for the other cells, and good for themselves at the level of cells and good for tissues, right, and good for organs, you see that you've got omni-win-win, not only across a radically wide horizontal scale, but across many layers of vertical scale, too. This, we, we've never really thought about design at this level in terms of the things that humans build, but we actually have to moving forward. And so you see that a human is this synergistic emergent capacity, so much more than the capacity of its cells because of the way the cells work together that creates something that is more than the sum of its parts taken separately. Uh, so how do we start to imagine an anti-rivalrous system at the level of humans? We've only had them at small scales. So a tribe will be anti-rivalrous with itself, but maybe with another tribe. Maybe a few tribes, if, he, if it's more efficient for them to have trade with each other than war, will be anti-rivalrous with each other, but they can defect out of that. When the consequence of rivalrous dynamics is existential, we have to create rigorously anti-rivalrous environments. And this is very much like humans going from just being a bunch of single cellular creatures to moving into a new body of humanity that is 
constant phenomena that, that hasn't happened yet. So think about the sharing economy. Think about ride sharing like Uber or Lyft. And, um, what that has already done is it has started to create a movement from transportation being a good that I purchase, that I own, possess, right, a car, to being a service that I have access to. And so the movement from possessing a good to having access to a service is a really fundamental shift. Because if you possess a particular good, I no longer have any access to it. So the good itself is rivalrous, right? You possess something, you take it outside of my capacity to access. But if you access a shared resource, you use a shopping cart when you go to the store, there's just enough shopping carts that during peak busyness time, there's enough shopping carts for everybody, but that's still radically less than if everyone who went to the store had their own shopping cart, which would be radically inefficient. Um, you having access to it does not decrease my access, right? So now you start to imagine, okay, well, so let's uh, use the blockchain or some decentralized computational system to decentralize, disintermediate the company of Uber or Lyft or whatever it is and make it really a commonwealth service. And then it becomes self-driving cars. And we start to see a future where transportation is an ubiquitous commonwealth service that everyone has access to that is not actually owned by, controlled by anybody. It is owned by the commons, which it is not even regulated by or governed by anyone in the traditional sense of what we have thought of it previously. And now you having access to that, because there's just going to be enough cars or transportation units that during peak resource time, there's plenty of them, including the ones that are in repair, right? But that's still going to be something like a 20th or a 40th of the number of cars that we currently have, which means so much less resource taken out of the earth for a higher quality of transportation service available to everybody because most of the cars spend most of their life sitting. And now right, the best car that could scientifically be built today can't ever be built because some of the intellectual property for the best car is owned by this company and some of the other intellectual property is owned by this company. And so, so even if you're the wealthiest person in the world, you cannot buy the best cell phone or laptop or medicine or car that could exist because we can't synthesize the intellectual property because we're trying to play rivalrous games of companies competing for market share and keeping the ideas separate, right, which decreases the innovation that's possible there. So now imagine if we could actually synthesize all the intellectual property. We didn't have to have all the budget that would go into marketing that gets to go back into product development. We didn't have designed in obsolescence. We actually had designed in modular upgradability. We could have radically higher quality of transportation available to everyone than any billionaire has access to today. Radically less resources taken from the earth. And your access doesn't decrease my access at all. So the good itself is not rivalrous in that particular scenario, which doesn't lead to a rivalrous relationship. Now say that the same is true for the science studios and the maker studios and the art studios and all of the things that you could possibly want to have for your enrichment and your creativity. Well, if you have access to everything that is fundamentally meaningful, getting things, and that's a, that's a base, baseline, then we're not conditioning the impulse to get things in the same way that when scarcity is the baseline and getting things is the only way to survive and then get ahead and move up Maslow's hierarchy, right? And so you have no status associated to getting things that everyone has access to. So then the only way you have differentiation or individuation is what you actually create. But you don't create something. You don't create a piece of tech or a piece of music to get money to buy something that you already have access to. You create it because that's the only interesting thing to do. And you have an education system and a civilization that is geared towards facilitating children finding out what is innately fascinating to them, what they're passionate about, and doing that. So now, if you have access to an art studio and you produce some great art, and I get to listen to that music now, I get to see those images, you produce some technology, you produce some medical breakthroughs, whatever it is, and I ha instantly have access, your access increases my access rather than your possession decreasing my access. So we go from a rivalrous ownership of goods model to an anti-rivalrous access to shared commonwealth resources model, where I'm invested in making sure you have maximum access possible, because the more access you have, the more generative you are, the more generative you are, the richer the commonwealth is that I have access to. We're not just moving to non-rivalrous, which is just decoupled. We're moving to anti-rivalrous, positively coupled. So to recap, the generator functions of all the problems we face in the world today and all the catastrophic and existential risks moving forward, we can really think of two generator functions. Rivalrous games, win-lose games, multiplied by exponential technology, self-terminate. Because exponential destructive capacity, finite playing field, self-terminates. We can't put exponential tech back in the bag, so we have to create anti-rivalrous games. That means anti-rivalrous incentive at the level of economics, governance, culture, and identity. The second generator function is complicated systems subsuming complex systems are fragile, open loop, materials economy, technological supply chain, consuming the closed loop, anti-fragile ecosystem, and trying to run exponentially more energy through an increasingly fragile system also inexorably collapses. 
And so we have to learn how to create complex rather than complicated civilizations. We have to create a civilization that is fully closed loop, meaning that we have atomic accounting. All of the new stuff is made from old stuff. We don't have net depletion or net accumulation toxicity anywhere. We can use new photons because those are coming in all the time, but not new atoms, right? So atomic cycling, new energy input, and basically unlimited information or pattern. So the future of the economy is being able to cycle atoms, upcycle them with the use of the energy input that we have daily into the creativity, which is pattern. Right? When we look at complicated systems where we don't have closed loop feedback, the key thing is that all of our technology, all of our complicated technology benefits some things and harms others. Right? Our computer gives us the capacity to do some great stuff, but the laptop has negative ergonomics that messes up our neck and our wrist because it wasn't paying attention to ergonomics. Or the anti-cholesterol med will lower our cholesterol, but it's toxic for the liver and the brain because it was only paying attention to cholesterol. Right? So we have, there are complex systems and we make a complicated solution, right? a solution for a finite set of metrics that's always less metrics than the whole. And we try and do an optimization function for the metrics we're paying attention to. The metrics we're paying attention to are always less than everything. Whichever metrics we aren't paying attention to, we externalize harm to. We have to learn how to not just do complicated, finite metric optimization and understand how complex systems self-regulate, how to work with those, and how to actually build complex systems. When you look at the fact that complicated systems are benefiting some things and harming others, you realize that's actually a rival risk-like dynamic because not having fully closed loop, it's a theory of trade-offs, right? We're benefiting something, harming something else. When we talked about democracy, when you make a proposition, if the proposition goes through, it benefits something and harms something, which is why some people like it and some don't. And if it doesn't go through, it benefits something, harms something. It's based on a theory of trade-offs. But in a radically interconnected world, those theory of trade-offs are always problematic. With exponentially more power, they're exponentially more problematic. When we talk about rival risk games, win-lose games, that's based on a theory of trade-offs of what's good for one in group will be bad for another out group or bad for the commons that all groups are part of. So fundamentally, we need to be moving from rival risk games to anti-rival risk games, from open loops to closed loops, from complicated systems to complex systems, and at the heart of it, from theory of trade-offs, benefit something, harm something, to synergistic satisfiers, understand how the whole fits together and how do we benefit the whole progressively better, right, as best as we can. Omni-consideration means we think about to consider, it, it both implies to care about and to think about, right? To think about the cause and effect and to care about it. Omni-consideration is progressively seeking to care about and think about the consequences of more, internalize those into the choice making and make choices that are omnipositive. And so we can say even deeper than that is a movement from identifying as something that is fundamentally separate, that could benefit at the expense of something else because the other is not a part of self to identifying as an emergent property of a complex interconnected system without which you wouldn't exist. What, what am I without the trees and the algae that produce the oxygen that makes the atmosphere? I'm nothing at all, right? So if I think about I without trees and algae, it's just not even a good way of thinking. It's a, it's a misnomer of a concept. What am I without the people that produce all of the technology that frames how I think it's the universe? And so a movement from identities that are fundamentally separate to identities that are fundamentally unique but interconnected. And from perception that is based on parts and fragmentation to perception that starts at the level of whole, sees the interconnectivity, and makes choices from there. So our level of technological capacity allows us to change things that we didn't think were changeable and actually forces change to things that we didn't think were changeable, also at speeds that we didn't think were changeable previously, which means that a lot of things that we've taken for granted as having already been figured out and being axiomatic foundations have to be reconsidered. So let's look at a couple of the things that we consider axioms of why we do economics the way we do and see how technology both makes possible and forces changes there. And one of the things that I really encourage everyone to do is to re-question the core axioms of governance, of culture, of the way you think about game theory, the way you think about evolutionary biology, because in the presence of the level of ability to change so deep in the stack of what we, of, of Earth, of ourselves, you think about genetic engineering, right? The level of genetic engineering, we're not just talking about humans evolving via natural selection, we're saying we could actually change our nature, not just change our nurture, change the thing that we call our nature. So then, do we want to genetically engineer ourselves to all be hyper-aggressive hypercomputers? Do we want to engineer aggression out of everyone? What is the basis upon which choices at that level of depth and significance would be made? This is ultimately a set of ethical questions and existential questions. Now, the tricky part here is that the technology that gives us the ability to do that is applied science. And science as a f philosophic system for understanding the nature of the objective world has long held itself to be uncommensurable 
with any system of ethics, that ethics is a subjective thing, science studies the objective, so science can say what is, but not what ought. So if science says we have no ethical system, we have no basis of what good is, what ought is, and not only that, but any system of ought is gibberish, and yet it provides the power, be it the applied form of technology, to change everything and make paradises or hells, then we say, well, what ends up guiding all of the science and technology, and right now it's who can fund the research which then is what research is going to make most money within capitalism or make most effective wars or et cetera. So ultimately it's social Darwinism and game theory funding the direction of the future of civilization. That's not adequate. We have to really think much more deeply about how to utilize the new power that we have. So I'll say it in kind of a mythopoetic way. Exponential tech is giving us something a lot like the power, right? The ability to destruct and create and change reality so much more powerfully than we could previously. As we are scaling to the power of gods, we have to have the love and wisdom of gods to make good choices with that power or we self-destruct with that much power. Right now we are not scaling in our wisdom and love as fast as we are scaling in our power. That is an essential thing to think about changing. So as we contemplate axioms, come to uh, economics, one of the foundational set of, one of the foundational lines of reasoning for why capitalism has sense is that there's a lot of jobs done for a technological civilization that are not really fun jobs. Laying roads and laying bricks, sewer pipes and lots of things, right? And yet we like a civilization that can do stuff. So that means that the jobs need to do them. So how do we get the people to do jobs that they wouldn't do just for intrinsic motivation? We use extrinsic motivation. We use reward and punishment systems. And so if you look at kind of a, say, a Marxist idea, well, let's go ahead and split the resources up so everybody has basic resources, then no, who wants to do the jobs that nobody wants to spend that much life doing? Nobody does, so then the state has to force them. We call it imperial. We don't like communism. So we say, okay, instead, we'll make it to where since the jobs need the people, that the people also need the jobs. So if they have resources and they have to work for a living, then we've created a kind of symmetry there. So what that means is we use the free market to force the people to do the jobs because otherwise they're homeless. Technological automation portends changing this completely in the next not that many years, right? So if we can write a procedure for how to do a particular task, we can make a machine robot computer that does the task better than us. And we're at the point now where we can actually do that for almost everything. There are some areas where we're, the only reason we're not roboticizing them faster is because the people protest that because they want to keep their shitty jobs that they actually wouldn't do if they had more money because they need money, right? But as soon as you make it to where the jobs don't need the people anymore, you can also make a new form of economics where the people don't need the jobs and the focus becomes a commonwealth economics where people have access to shared commonwealth resources and this becomes a shift from an extrinsic incentive which means control manipulation right an extrinsic incentive economy to an intrinsic incentive you can call it ecology more where the focus then of education is not prepare kids for the workforce the focus of education is find out what the unique interests passions gifts aptitudes of each human being are and facilitate those. And if that's the way someone is facilitated, then you see the way that scientists, independent of who's paying them for anything, can't stop doing their science because they are pulled by their love of it, their fascination, the way artists, the way musicians. And that basically, the, the things that we can't automate are things that involve creativity and connection, which are the things that humans happen to be intrinsically motivated to do anyways. So the technological automation makes possible a commonwealth economics where the, intrin the thing people are intrinsically incented to do is the only thing that actually really matters to do. As we're rethinking economics, one of the core concepts that we have to rethink is what is value? What do we value? What is the basis to value something relative to something else? Because we think about what economics is, it's very much our value systems, right? Which is almost like a metaphysical thing, codified into a series of value equations that then determines what infrastructure we build, what technology we build, and what gets empowered. And so if we look at the world today, a living whale in the ocean is not economically worth anything to anybody. But if you're a fishing boat, it's hundreds of thousands or a million dollars as whale meat, right? So we value the dead, commodified, extracted whale. We don't value the living whale. And as a result, we have extincted so many species, hunted most of the whales, you know, the biodiversity loss writ large because of what we value. If we value things that are scarce, right? Because if something is scarce, not everybody can have it. So if I have it, I get some differential advantage in a rivalrous game, competitive game. If we value things that are scarce, we will artificially manufacture scarcity. And we will continue to create scarcity because the thing is only valuable in proportion to its scarcity. And so you can see in marketing, you know, buy now, only three days left, only nine spots left. We're artificially 
artificially manufacturing scarcity. You can see in the way that we uh, hide, burn, and crush diamonds to make them seem more scarce than they really are because we originally thought they were scarce before we found where all the diamonds are. That's the motive of anyone who has them and wants to keep the valuation high. Air is worth economically nothing, you notice, even though we die in a few minutes without it because I can't get more of it. I can't get competitive advantage uh, by having it. There's no seeming scarcity of it, but because it's not there's no economic value attributed to it because it's abundant. It's not on the balance sheets that determine choices that are made, and so we pollute it and burn it up. And we pollute it and burn it up to get the gold, which is worth a whole lot, to put in a safe that does absolutely nothing for anyone other than change the competitive value of a balance sheet. So as long as we value that which is scarce, we will continue to create scarcity. If we want a world of abundance, we have to stop valuing scarcity and start seeking to engineer scarcity out of the system, which we actually technologically can do almost everywhere. That hasn't been the goal. One of the other things we have to think about with regard to value is that not all things that are valuable are exchangeable. They're not all extractable, commodifiable, exchangeable. So when I see a sunset, there is a value to my life of seeing a sunset or seeing a rainbow or hearing birds or experiencing love or experiencing poetry. Or, but I can't give that sunset to someone else as a commodity, right? And so, but if I, and if I see a tree and it's beautiful, my experience has value to me, but it doesn't have economic value. But if I cut the tree down and I sell it as lumber, that has economic value. And the economic value confers competitive advantage. And so when we have a value system that only values things that are extractable and exchangeable, and we don't ascribe value to things that are not extractable and exchangeable, then there will be a gradient to destroy the non-exchangeable things for the ones that are exchangeable. And we can see that in all of the issues in the world. Fundamentally, there are things that you cannot make a currency for. Right, that you cannot be able to exchange with a type of currency. And we have to think about how do we have that which we value valued in the way we think about economics and the way that we think about what fundamentally incentivizes patterns of human behavior. So as we are rethinking civilization, we're rethinking how we build technology and how we build infrastructure. We're rethinking governance, economics, law, jurisprudence, and ethics as the basis of law. We're rethinking culture and identity, and then how all this comes together in a full-stack, self-organizing civilization. When we think about economics and governance, both economics and governance can be thought of as processes of choice-making, collective choice-making. So when we think about economics within capitalism, if I have more money, that means I have more concentrated choice-making capacity. I can gain access to resource and decide what to do with those resources, and I can basically put other people under my employment to carry out my choices. And so money is, capitalism, ownership is actually a choice-making system where the underlying idea is that to get more money I had to produce goods and services that the world actually valued in an effective way that the world valued, and that, and if I did, that meant that I was better at productivity things than other people were, therefore I make good decisions with the resources I have, so I should steward more resource. That was the core idea. Except, of course, I can gain access to money through production or extraction, and they're not the same, and extraction's easier. So I can watch somebody else work really hard, spend a lot of money innovating, copy their thing, you know, and basically extract their ideas. I can extract resource from the environment that I didn't actually produce. I didn't produce fish, I didn't produce trees, right? I extracted them. And yet, <clears throat> then I have capital that is gaining compounding interest on itself. And so I have all of the to hoard it and to continue to maximize extraction. So it's super critical to understand the production extraction. But as we think about that capitalism is a system, right? And money is a form of choice making. Governance is a choice making system. If we come together and make choices. We want to just kind of scrap all of the way we think about both of those systems and scrap thinking about them as separate and say, beyond our own choice making as individuals, there are layers of collective choice making that happen because we interaffect each other at the level of a family, right? At the level of groups of families that interact, maybe that we can think of as a tribal level, at the level of cities that self-organize, right? At the level of bioregions, at the level of the And so the question becomes, how do we have better systems of sense-making, making sense of what's happening and what matters forward is and making choices that are, are the best synergistic satisfiers towards what matters for all that we've made sense of and how do we do both of those things together progressively better? So one key insight is that before we go to choice making, we have to do good sense making, right? If before I decide where to step, I want my eyes to be open and looking at the ground. And so if I'm going to decide, I'm trying to decide 
yes or no on a proposition to put a bridge across a river in this area. But I haven't yet fully understood what is everything that is impacted by that choice. The goal of put the bridge across was somebody's goal that said, let's decrease the amount of time it takes to do this drive. But the people who are not going to want it is because that bridge is going to damage fisheries. Maybe it's going to uh, damage the the uh, on each side of it. Maybe it's going to move residential areas that it wasn't previously, right? The question becomes, if we make sense all context map, what is everything connected to this topic that matters to everyone? Can we have a civic problem, the sense-making first that surfaces? What is everything that's meaningful? What are all the questions that need answered? What are all the assumptions? And then be able to create design constraints from that to go into an integrated design process where we might say maybe a barge can do it, maybe a suspension of a different kind or at a different point. Maybe we don't need to get across the river here because we the goal is really for one company and we can just create how there's so many more possibilities that open up once we've made better sense of what the whole system is and so as we think about the evolution of economics and the evolution of governance I want us to think deeper about the evolution of how we individually and collectively make sense of the world make sense of what matters and what's meaningful and go about collective design process of integrated solutions So humans looked around at nature and saw the apex predators in their environment and realized that because of our tool making capacity, we were apex predators and we modeled ourselves as apex predators. And so the apex predator wants to be able to, you know, hunt and uh, extract effectively and beat the other apex predators. The thing about humans that's different than all the other animals is that we evolve our predatory capacity rapidly through our tool making. And as predatorily brilliant as a great white shark is, it increases its capacity to hunt over the course of hundreds of thousands or millions of years of slow evolution while the seals that it's hunting are also getting better at getting away from it, right? Great white sharks don't quickly develop mile-long drift nets to be able to pull all of the fish out of the ocean the way that we've developed mile-long drift nets, right? Which is why they don't extinct other species and we're extincting other species, you know, at, at a, a rapid scale. And so because of our capacity for abstraction, we can understand the principle of tools and evolve and make better tools. There's a number of animals that use tools, but they use the same tools they were using 10,000 years ago. And if you give a gorilla or a chimpanzee a knife as opposed to a sharp rock and they're trying to cut something, they'll recognize experientially that it's sharp and they'll use it, but they don't understand the abstract principle of sharpness and design a better knife. Um, and then design a laser, right? So there's a process of our capacity for abstraction that made us these tool, not just builders, but tool evolvers. But you cannot act like an apex predator with exponentially increasing predatory capacity independent of not exponentially increasing capacity of your environment to handle that kind of predation. And so as we have the level of technological capacity where we can extinct whole species, we can destroy whole biospheres, we can start to make new species, we can't think of ourselves as apex predators and make it anymore. So we have to say, what has that kind of power? Because sharks don't have that kind of power. Don't have that kind of power. The only thing that has the power that radically is nature itself. And so the new model, the new metaphor has to not be homo sapien as peak predator, but homo sapien as an agent for nature itself evolving the orderly complexity of the whole. Where we move from just being a part of the whole, being acted on by evolutionary forces, to being an agent for the whole, the evolution of the whole itself, where we use our capacity for abstraction to actually understand that evolution is evolving the orderly complexity of the whole thing, that, in, that a predator doesn't work without the prey and without the whole biosphere in which it works. So nature's not really selecting for individual animals, it's selecting for whole self-organizing tropes and biospheres. How do we make that kind of shift? Our capacity for abstraction gave us the ability to understand the abstract principle of leverage or the abstract principle of sharpness and make a knife or a better lever rather than just notice which ones are better in the environment and use them like would. Most all of that time until now based on one particular average trait or the sharpness trait. We made a simple tool with those things. Then we started to focus on a handful of traits and put those together. Our, our simple and then complicated tools have been abstraction focused on parts, not focused on holes. We're now getting to the place that we can actually understand the complexity of how biology works, of how cells work, of how psychologies, of how ecosystems, of how nature works, and not just make complicated tools with our abstraction capacity, but actually work to do what nature is doing and make complex self-organizing systems. This is a key shift, is that our abstraction capacity has made us so powerful, but powerful at making parts that are not integrated with how whole system works. 
we are now too powerful in our part making to be able to do that. The next step is for our abstraction capacity to actually understand how evolving wholeness itself works and become stewards of that. So complicated systems, systems that humans have made so far, are cognized, designed from the outside, built from the outside. The human is not the microprocessor, right? The human builds the microprocessor, but they aren't the microprocessor. Self-organizing systems, complex systems, aren't built from the outside, right? The cell is generating itself and is the intelligence that is evolving, developing itself. When humans think of ourselves as outside of the biosphere and we're trying to make complicated systems out here, we think of ourselves as outside of self-organization. As soon as we recognize ourselves as the result of a self-organizing universe and still a part of a self-organizing biosphere, then we can start to become conscious stewards of self-organization of the whole. So if we came upon some caterpillars, and we didn't know what caterpillars were, and we didn't already know the story of the chrysalis and the butterfly, and we just saw the way that they were eating everything in their ecosystem unrenewably and not pollinating, and we watched them over the course of a little while eat more and get bigger so they could eat faster, and we forecasted based on the curve that we were watching, a continuation of that curve, what we would forecast is that they eat themselves into extinction. If we saw a uh, fetus growing inside of a uterus and we didn't know what the birth process was, but we saw that it was uh, consuming up resource from the mother in a way that was getting harder and harder on the mother's body, taking up space in the abdomen, and we didn't know that it was going to go through this discrete phase shift called birth, we would say, oh, pretty soon this is the baby is going to kill itself and the mother. If we looked at a uh, you know, chicken or bird or you know, lizard kind of embryo developing inside of a shell, and we didn't know that its time in the shell was finite, we would see that it was consuming scarce resource, right, the white that was in there, and it was polluting in its space without really a clear plan of what was going to happen next. All of these are fetal, larval, developmental time periods, and the developmental time period is characterized by net growth and consumption in a fundamentally unsustainable way, because it's not supposed to be sustainable, to get to the point where it can go through a discrete phase shift. The chrysalis, where the caterpillar switches to butterfly, the uh, birth process where the umbilical cord is cut and the baby is now in a new growth process but defined by totally different characteristics, the breaking out of the shell. We can see throughout all of biology these kinds of examples where developmental time periods are defined by this unsustainable growth consumption to gather the capacity to go through a discrete phase shift into a new mode that has different sustainability characteristics. That chicken that emerges from the eggshell has a beak that can eat seeds from plants that it's it's part of this closed loop cycle, but it, that beak, when it was just forming you no know, acid soup of the egg white, right? The same is true of the fetus, the same is true of the caterpillar. Now, the caterpillar that wasn't pollinated, devastating its whole ecosystem, ends up becoming a butterfly that, because it can fly, is pollinating across such places that it's supporting the evolution of the plant species across these huge areas, right? So the caterpillar seems terrible for plants. The butterfly is necessary for the evolution of the whole biosphere developmental phase shift. Now the caterpillar has organs that do certain functions and the butterfly has similar organs, digestive organs, respiratory, cardiovascular, but the butterfly organs are not just slightly modified caterpillar organs. The caterpillar organs almost completely dissolve and then reassemble with different genetic codes, this is our best current understanding inside the chrysalis, into a creature with a fundamentally different reason for being. It's not net parts, but you see the key is if the caterpillar had parts, it wouldn't be able to make a butterfly. It's got acids and the fatty acids and the minerals necessary to make a butterfly, if it had stopped halfway through the gathering process, it would have got partway through making a butterfly, just died, right, which happens sometimes. What's interesting is the caterpillar, as soon as it has a rich enough blood chemistry to, you know, that's signaling that it has the raw resources necessary for the phase shift, the phase shift starts kicking in. The baby, 40 weeks in utero, if it was born much earlier, it would die, but if it waited much later, it would die. It has the physiology to emerge and it has to emerge around the same time. This chicken, there's these very narrow windows where emergence phase shift has to and can occur simultaneously. And the phase shift is unpredicted from the phase previous. Watching just the embryo develop the egg, and you, if you didn't know about the whole universe outside the egg, you'd have no way of predicting what it was like the phase shift. So civilizations 